Hello. I heard you've been reading a lot about the 1950s. So far back. So ancient. Hard to believe that they had cars and appliances, but then did. Kids listened to music on the radio, AM radio, and watched corny television programs on the new television that was still working on making its way into the majority of American homes. TVs were hooked to big antennas alongside or on top of the house unless you used the V-shaped rabbit ears that sat on top of the TV. Eisenhower was the president. He beat the Democrat, Adley Stevenson twice, in 1952 and in 1956. Americans liked Ike, as they called him. He was a kindly, older man who reminded everyone of his or her grandfather. The Republicans chose him as their presidential candidate not because the party bigwigs liked him, but because the Republicans wanted a war hero. They felt certain that would assure them they could finally win back the White House. Ike got the job done, especially with the help of Walt Disney who created the first famous TV ad for a presidential candidate. It was called I Like Ike, and that became Eisenhower's unofficial campaign slogan. Ike also promised American voters that he would go to Korea and end the stalemated war. Once again, Ike delivered. Soon after Ike became president, he made a trip to Korea and the United Nations negotiated an armistice with the North Koreans. An armistice stops the fighting, but it takes a peace treaty to officially end a war. The armistice is still in effect in Korea to this day, but there has yet been no peace treaty. Still, American soldiers have not been in combat in Korea since the armistice was signed. As you may have read, Ike decided to cut defense costs by reshaping the American military. He decided to base American national security on the development of an expansive and strong nuclear arsenal. A very large number of men were cut from the active military. Some of the salaries that would have been paid to these discharged men were considered savings allowing the government to better balance the budget. The remainder of the discharged men's salaries was spent on nuclear bombs and missiles. The United States worked on creating a three-pronged nuclear force made up of long-range bombers, land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles. As a result, the United States built its first nuclear-powered submarines capable of staying at sea for months at a time. American industry in the 1950s dominated the world. American manufactured goods were considered the highest quality goods available. Because of the damage done in World War II, many nations around the world were not in a position to challenge American production or the distribution of American goods into almost every world market including their own. American consumers were also prospering. America's unchallenged position in the international market meant American businesses were making substantial profits. Companies paid their white-collar workers competitive salaries. Blue-collar workers, especially those in unionized jobs, saw consistent wage increases, which brought them very near and sometimes even above the level of earning of lower white-collar workers. The GI Bill of Rights had made it possible for war vets to buy new homes. Many of these homes were in the newly developing suburbs. Over the decade of the 1950s, white Americans left the hearts of America's major cities and moved to the suburbs where they had lawns, houses, and highly segregated communities away from the increasing squalor of the inner city. These suburbanites still worked in the business district of the inner city, but they commuted from their suburban homes in cars that increased in numbers until they began to clog the major traffic arteries leading into the cities. In some East Coast cities, commuters rode on trains bringing them into New York City from Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania or into Philadelphia from the counties around the city and from New Jersey across the Delaware River. Those left in the cities after what came to be called white flight found themselves living in increasingly deteriorating conditions. These individuals were predominantly minorities, blacks, Hispanics from Puerto Rico or Mexico, and a smattering of the poorest whites. Once proud neighborhoods devolved into dilapidated ghettos worse than those that had ever existed during the days of mass immigration in the 1880s and 1890s, white flight was followed by a slow but certain relocation of business. It moved from center city to the edges of the city. 
These new locations made it easier for some commuters to make their way to work. It made it harder if not impossible for those living in a center city to make their way to work because public transportation often did not reach these new work locations. In addition, the suburbanites' reliance on cars began the decline of the great city mass transportation systems as city money was diverted into newer broader major streets and constant street maintenance. Successful American mass production provided the salaries or wages needed to make Americans consumers at a level never achieved before in the nation's history. The middle and upper classes bought cars, appliances of all types and designs, home power tools, and an array of amazing new gizmos that came on the market. The new 50s music blared from radios. Particularly disturbing to many suburbanite parents was the new version of African-American jazz and blues that became shaded white in the form of rock and roll. Elvis Presley was the most popular white performer of this music complete with the scandalous jiggling of his hips that caused proper ladies to blush and cover their eyes. Young people loved this music. With increasing frequency it moved from all African-American stations or venues to the mainstream, rising on the American Billboard chart. However, the recording industry, deeply concerned about the reactions of segregationist white Southerners made certain that white performers sang the rock and roll music that made its way to the radio. Black performers were insulted and enraged at this cultural ripoff, but under the conditions of the time, there was little they could do. Radio stations and their advertisers wanted white performers who brought in white customers to stores that were segregated. During his time as president, Eisenhower was forced to deal with the issue of segregation. The Supreme Court ordered the integration of Little Rock High School. The Arkansas governor decided to defy the Supreme Court of the United States. As president, Eisenhower was left with the task of enforcing the Supreme Court's order. Although many urged him to defy the court, Eisenhower saw it as his presidential duty to enforce the court order. He sent federal troops to Little Rock to integrate the high school and ensure the safety of the black students now attending the school. Eisenhower's actions infuriated most white Southerners who thereafter hated him until the day he left office. Eisenhower faced several more problems in his presidency. In one instance an American spy plane, a U-2 super-secret jet, was shot down over the Soviet Union. The administration tried to pass it off as a weather plane that only just entered Soviet airspace. Finally, Eisenhower took to the television to deny the United States had been spying on the Soviets. As soon as he made his statement, the Soviets took to their television with pictures of the downed plane and worse the CIA pilot, Francis Gary Powers. What an embarrassment for Ike. Powers was supposed to kill himself if he got shot down, but he didn't do it. Now he was a prisoner of the Soviets. He was interrogated to learn all about the many years of American spy plane over flights of the Soviet Union. The Soviets used the spy plane incident as an excuse to scuttle the Geneva summit between Khrushchev and President Eisenhower. Then in his last year in office, the revolutionary Fidel Castro successfully overthrew of the corrupt Cuban government. Eisenhower and his administration were deeply concerned with the protection of the extensive American investments in the island. Castro pressed for nationalization of many properties. This angered Washington, which began trying to control and then isolate Castro. Castro quickly sought Soviet support for his new regime. Eisenhower now found himself under serious political fire for allowing Cuba to go communist. Much as Truman had come under fire for allowing China to go communist, 